Expect the best used car deals guaranteed. Visit arnoldclark.com. Welcome to Peter and Ruffy's Football Show, sponsored by Arnold Clark. It's Wednesday the 10th of June. Great to have your company. Tom McManus and Alan Ruff are here with me. We've got 300 spare batteries, 500 dilithium crystals and a flux capacitor to make sure, Ruffy, that you are with us today. Are yeah. you with us, Ruffy? Yeah, uh, obviously Tom doesn't know the circumstances of what happened yesterday. I was running a bit. I was jumping up to supermarkets trying to get batteries and, and checking all sorts of things. But uh, if it goes again today, you know, I've, I've tried everything. Yeah. So let's hope not. Let's hope not. Well, absolutely rough. I mean, that's what happens in this. It's very difficult times in lockdown. We've tried every bit of technology. It's working well. You get the odd glitch here and there. But if it doesn't work today, Ruffy, then uh, Barry is going to send over his flip-flops and you just put the boot right into the technology you have there. Uh, great to see Tam there, obviously just out of prison, as you can tell by the outfit. Um, <laughs> what, a, what, what about you, Tam McManus? We ask you to do one simple task. Go and ask your dad to get the memorabilia out and you can't do it you can't do it i don't know what it is peter i think my dad's lost all my strips i don't know where i don't know where all my stuff is i've got a couple of stickers here and a couple of strips if that's any use but all, all my main stuff is in my mum and dad's loft i think somewhere so hopefully we'll get yeah. it for friday well, listen, uh, there's lots to talk about. We'll have a wee look at what you've got there anyway. It's always good for a bit of banter on a football show. Uh, we have a one-to-one -one with Sean Maloney. Now, he's the assistant to Roberto Martinez at uh, Belgium's international squad. Uh, and I think it's a great insight into the players he's working with, the mentality <coughs> of uh, the Belgium squad, and, of course, the differences in training. Is there anything we can glean from Sean that will help the Scottish cause? Well, uh, stay with us for the one-to-one -one on that. He's got his thoughts on Odson, Edward, Celtic, Neil Lennon, uh, and, of course, lots of other issues in Scottish football. Really great to talk to him. Uh, so uh, another guest. We try and bring you as many top-drawer guests as possible. Uh, and uh, also, uh, Ruffy, um, of course, on this very day... Um, Back in 1998, we were actually thinking about the old World Cup, weren't we? Because Scotland were taking to the field on this very day against uh, Brazil, uh, which is absolutely amazing, Ruffy. See, see, this is what happens, Tam. If you just make sure you've got these things with you, you know, you can show... You must have some size in. of his. Well, that <laughs> crap you've got. <laughs> Tam, honestly, I think I'm listening to my wife the minute you delivered that line. <laughs> because that's exactly what she says to me as well. But nevertheless, Ruffy, I just want to tell you this, because it's on this day, it's unusual when we start with it, but have a look at the teams from 1998, Ruffy, when we qualified. Leighton Boyd, Calderwood Henry, Daly, Lambert Burley, Collins Gallagher, Jurian Jackson, uh, Billy McKinley and Tosh McKinley. I mean, uh, honestly, I mean, the Brazilian side, Rivaldo, Ronaldo, Bebeto, um, they looked as Cesar Sampao as well. They looked a good side too. Cafu, um, unbelievable, wasn't it? We were opening the World Cup in France all those years ago, 22 years ago, Rafi. Yeah, I think everybody thought going into that game we were going to get a hammer. Uh, but credit to the players, uh, they came out with a, a really good formation and, and players playing at the top of their game going into a World Cup. Uh, obviously, the own goal was a bit of a downer, but uh, certainly when, when John Collins scored that penalty, you know, we all thought, oh, here we go. But uh, Brazilians being Brazilians, you know, that uh, I don't think that was the, the, the greatest Brazilian side that graced the World Cup, but certainly they were, they, they were very, very good. But no, I think the Scotland boys did remarkably well that day. It wasn't uh, a one-sided game and uh, they, did, they did particularly well. Yeah. Tom, what age were you in 1998? Uh, I was 17. Um, I watched the game in Tenerife with my auntie and uncle in a pub, uh, the Hole in the Wall, Irish pub in Tenerife. And uh, I can remember watching the game and there were a lot of Scotland fans there and we went one each. We all thought, oh, you know, we'll get, get a result here and have a chance of getting getting something from Brazil. But obviously, Ruffy said the own goal killed us. But I'm just looking at what, what a good team we had as well. You know, we had some top players as well back then. And it's just a pity that you know, I mean, never really got a doing off anybody back then, Peter, did we? We, we were well organised under Craig Brown. We, we, yeah. We kinda, we're hard to beat, and uh, we, we proved that in that tournament. But I think we need to get, try and get back to being hard to beat again and maybe find a system that suits us because uh, it's, been, it's been a very long time since we were last there. 
Well, funny you saying that, Tam. That's an interesting point you raised because Sean Maloney was having a chat with me, obviously, in this one-to-one. -one. He was talking about the fact that uh, I mentioned to him the fact that you said there, you know, some people I remember roughly in 98 would say they wouldn't open the curtains to watch Craig Brown's side because they had that dogged, hard-to-beat, well-organised uh, side about them. But they had quality to go and score a goal and then hang on to it, roughly. That was one of the key elements that they could, they could do. They could score a goal and they could keep them out at the other end. Yeah. Yeah, but if you ask any good manager, that's all about it. It's about playing to the strengths of the players you've got at your uh, availability, you know, and that's what he did. You know, he picked players. Uh, another, another. Uh, I'm sure in Craig's company, he's probably said to you as well, you know, that he, he never got a lot of credit for playing a lot of young players. You know, he, he, a lot of people think he seemed to stick with the experienced players and never gave the youngsters a chance. But Craig would put you right in that one, that uh, there is a few young players that he, he, he blooded into the Scotland side. Yeah, absolutely. Listen, it was a, it was a wonderful time. Um, but uh, Tam, just back on that point you mentioned there about they were difficult to meet, uh, Sean Maloney, very much of the opinion that, you know, we've got a great cr crop of players coming through and you'll hear that from a great crop of players and you know, he thinks technically we should be uh, looking towards going and having a go at teams. He highlighted the, the last 12 months of Gordon Strachan uh, where we could take the game to some teams. We had the technical ability. We were just sensing a bit of confidence about ourselves. So it'll be interesting to get your thoughts on it anyway. Uh, I've got to say hi to Kevin Gill, um, who says, let's get the arguments going. Kevin, you'll never believe it. We've been, we've been doing um, lots of uh, good chatting, not arguing too much, uh, especially when Ruffy fails to actually turn up for the show. Uh, and lots of people saying, hi, did Ruffy get paid yesterday? <laughs> Ruffy, how, how come everybody cares for your well? <laughs> send money now, send checks. Yeah. Up. I'm up. Oh, no, I'm, exactly. I'm just hoping I don't bump into that boy up in the supermarket I rubbered ear yesterday. <laughs> when he tried to talk to me and I just I just volleyed him. <laughs> really? uh, you must apologise to him Listen, uh, the other good thing about it I don't know if you get this Tam But uh, any time, I know some people mention you to, to, to give them a mention And there are lots of people that we're getting Who are following the programme uh, Gary Gardner is in Queensland, Australia And he says sometimes, Peter, obviously I have to watch it at a, at a better time Because it goes out through the night uh, In Queensland, he says And then I pick up in the morning and watch the show So, And also if you guys can do me a favour here, uh, Tegan is 14, uh, she's Tegan Kelly and her, her dad sent me a little message saying she does a lot of work for charity, uh, she's found lockdown very tough, is there any chance we can give her a wee mention and I think it's only right and proper, Tegan you're doing a great job, lockdown's tough, uh, stick with your family, stick to the rules and we are delighted that you do lots of good work, is that fair Tam, can you give her a, a wee mention? Yeah. Yeah, happy 14th, Tegan. Keep doing what you're doing and have a good day. Can I just add that it's my uh, my young nephew's birthday today as well. Uh, Lee, Lee Kerndorf, he's 15 today. He's a massive Rangers fan. His dad's a massive Rangers fan. They're both season ticket holders, so they get in the back door at my house. Uh, but I'd just like to wish him a happy birthday today. Uh, happy birthday, Lee. Yeah, I would okay. say well done, Te well done, Tegan as well. You know, happy birthday and and all the good work that you've done. A lot of people will remember it. Uh, so yeah, let's hope we can all move on eventually. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, so I'm just writing down here, Ruffy. Uh, Ten past four. Mike Manis admits Rangers fans in family. So there we have it, then, Ruffy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's a few, there's saying, plenty. Oh, oh there's seeping in, there's seeping in. Peter. You're, you're saying that as if this is this is unbelievable. I can't believe it. <laughs> oh God, that's fantastic. Uh, I need to tell my I need to tell my wife, Tam. <laughs> that's fantastic. Anyway, uh, I tell you right now, um, if Scotland were playing uh, in my garden, says Kevin, I'd close the blinds. Well. You know, listen, maybe maybe our attitude will change over a period of time, Kevin. Um, we'd all like to see Scotland doing well. We're going to get onto that Scotland thing and do listen to, to Sean Maloney. It really is a good one to one to hear his thoughts. Um, lots of things to talk about as well. James Anderson. OK, here's Neil Doncaster's reaction to James Anderson giving uh, money without any, uh, you know, there's no ties in it. There's no caveats of 
reconstruction or anything. The extremely generous donation from James will help protect all of our clubs from the very worst effects of COVID-19, enabling them to return to playing as early as it's safe to do so, whilst continuing to reach out and support communities as they have done throughout the pandemic. We know the positive power our clubs have within their communities during this crisis. They have stepped up <coughs> to support thousands of socially isolated and vulnerable people who desperately needed help. On behalf of every one of the SPFL's 42 clubs, I want to sincerely thank James for his timely and extremely generous financial support at this critical moment. It is just incredible, first of all, before we hear what James Anderson had to say, it's an incredible gesture, Tom. Yeah, as listen, it's it's a fantastic gesture. You know, I was I was queen, I was a little bit suspicious of it. And uh, you know, I'd like to apologise to Anne Budge as well just now because I thought it was a little bit of financial blackmail when I said that. It turns out it wasn't, it turns out I was totally wrong. And you've got to have a little bit of humility about you and admit you're wrong. And, uh, you know, it's a great gesture from James Anderson. Um, and, and great for Am Budge to get him um, to the SPFL's door and get the money to the clubs. So I'd like to give both of them, both James Anderson and Dan Budge, massive credit for what they've done uh, for the clubs. Because this will help massively. I only hope that the Premiership clubs give their share to the lower league clubs. Because I think that would add even more value to the money that they're getting. Because League One, League Two clubs must be on their knees and really struggling just now. The Premiership clubs have had quite a bit of a payout uh, from TV money, etc., and league placing. So I hope that the James Anderson money does go from Championship down. I think it would be more of benefit to, to all those clubs. I'm going to address that point that you've just raised in a moment. Here's what James Anderson has mentioned with regards to the donation. Football is at the heart of communities across Scotland, and there are not many soci uh, societal organisations that bring people together nowadays to catch them in a net when they fall. I've seen firsthand what a difference clubs can make to people's lives and so I'm very pleased to have been able to offer my support at this difficult time. I'm also committing my ongoing support to Scottish football by way of confirming I will make further donations. I've also introduced others who share my values and who are committed to do the same. This is the start of our journey together. I have great faith in the <coughs> SPFL Trust and confidence that they will take this opportunity and make a great success of it. Okay, Ruffy, I'm going to get your thoughts because every time I read something from someone, you cough during the middle of it. Um, what did you make of that one? <laughs> yeah, no, I thought it was, uh, I, I think it's very good. that the, I mean, there are people out there who are very, very wealthy. They do a lot of things behind the scenes that a lot of people don't see. You know, this is one he's came up front uh, and helping all the, the teams out. I think it's absolutely sensational. Uh, we we'll saw player. Well, we've we have seen it at Partick Thistle with Colin Weir uh, having a lot of money with the lottery. Very, very generous, and and basically it's to help people. You know, it's to help the the communities and help everybody put a smile on their face. And that's what he's certainly done. And and well done to him. You know, we we'll saw it down through the years. That there are people out there who are very, very wealthy, prepared to donate a lot of money to whatever charity or whatever reason. Uh, and well done to them. John Miller says, no free lunch, don't believe it for a second. John, I must admit, lots of us were cynical, John, probably sharing yeah. your view on this one, but this one doesn't come with any ties at all. There, there, are, there are no little loopholes in it to say this must happen or that must happen. Um, that is the, the one genuine thing here. Here's how this money is going to be dispersed, uh, Tam, which might open up uh, to you guys, uh, first of all, the money that that's going to all the clubs. SPFL Trust reaches agreement with James Anderson. The donation is three million uh, to help clubs and support their communities. Every club will be eligible to receive a fifty thousand pound grant for support during the crisis, provided the evidence uh, provided the evidence community benefit. Um, the donation uh, comes without uh, qualification of preconditions relating to future structure or governance at the SPFL, which is backing up the point and blowing out what John was suggesting there. Uh, funding will also be used to accelerate the launch of a new national SPFL trust programme, Scottish Football United, which is expected to engage clubs, leagues, governing bodies and a range of public sector organisations. A separate fund, the Anderson Fund, will also be established. Uh, Mr Anderson has confirmed his intention to provide further additional funding both directly and possibly via others in his network. Now, two quick issues here. I think the great thing, Ruffy, is that they're going to continue their funding. So that will help. So clubs can then apply for the grant 
it's in the trust. Mm -hmm. So that's great. So I, I'm wondering then, Tam, if it goes back to your point, I'm not so sure everybody is all getting a split of the money. I think you're you're making your play for the need in, in your club and your community. Yeah, yeah, I think that, that's what it is. I, mean, I think it's got to go to the community. I think it's got to go to support your fans. And um, listen, I think that's just a great gesture. I'm reading down that. It's just, it's, it's brilliant. And Listen, I understand people being cynical about it because, you know, it's a large amount of money for someone just to give away. Um, he's helping support clubs and, and, and support people and you've got to take your hat off to him. You know, it's, it's, it's a brilliant gesture. The SPFL Trust do a lot of great work. You know, I've been to a few of their charity golf days and supported them. And, uh, you know, with, with Nicky Reid and that, they do a really great job and they will get that money out to the clubs that need it. I just, I, I'll reiterate my, my first point, Peter. I, I'd, I'd just rather that the clubs further down get more money than rather than the, like Celtic and Rangers and Aberdeen and Hibs. Do they need that 50 grand more than Anne and Aris Fife or Albin Overs? I mean, it could keep them, you know, keep them going, keep them in the game, keep them afloat. So uh, I'd like to think maybe some of the clubs would, would say give it to the, to the teams lower down. That, that's just my opinion. I, I, I'd like to believe at this point, uh, Ruffy, and I haven't had it confirmed yet, but I, I would imagine that not too many of the Premiership clubs will be looking towards that money. I think they will realise exactly the point that Tam is emphasising. Yeah, you would like to think so, Peter. Uh, as Tam's just said there, the top to bottom, you know, they got 3 million, 2 million. I think the bottom team got 1.25 million. You would think 50,000 would be more beneficial to the, the first and the second division teams. But uh, I think you're right. I think a lot of the, the bigger clubs will be sensible about this one. Uh, and I think the good thing of the whole thing is it's in a trust. You know, it's not, you can't label it to the SPFL, you know, the delegates and the, the, the committees and all that. It's in a trust. So that takes the, the pressure away for everybody saying about, oh, it's just because of hearts and all that. So, no, no, it's an organisation that are going to look after the benefit of uh, all the Scottish teams. Yeah, absolutely. Eddie Thompson says it's a trust fund and you have to apply for it with the condition it helps the community. So um, hopefully over a period of time, if any club is in trouble as well, uh, you know, this is the perfect safety net just to get us through and then let the clubs, as they are businesses, try and work their way through it as well. Kathleen Miller's joined us. Hi, Kathleen. Great for you to be with us on our Facebook Live. Uh, and I'll give a mention to lots of people on YouTube as well. Um, and uh, uh, John Kearney says, watch what you're saying, lads. Don't offend the snowflakes. Um, there's lots of people on here <clears throat> who are seeing uh, the benefit of what James Anderson is doing. Some people obviously a little bit sceptical, but that's what it's all about. Football's about opinions, but I, I like what you're saying, Tam, on it. I think we should look for the, the clubs in, with a greater need to be helped out on this. Now, coming up very shortly, apart from that, Ruffy, uh, we've had a look at how the money's going to be dispersed. Also, the SPFL were meeting today to discuss those reconstruction proposals. Now, and budgets, is it going to get off the ground? Has it got any momentum? I don't think so. And if you were reading this morning's papers, certainly it looks as if, and certainly from the people that I've been talking to and hearing from in other quarters, the chances of Rangers' reconstruction proposal doesn't look as if it's going to get off the ground either. No, we seem to have muddied the waters a wee bit, you know, by introducing all these different uh, ideas, you know, some is like some of it. We don't like others, you know. And and there's too many, there's too many complications now. I, I think we've wandered too far away from 14, 10, 10, and 10. That that for me was the simplest way to keep everybody happy. Not not too many disappointed people. Nobody saying, oh, we're going to drop down a division here. We're not going to get promoted. We're not going to get this and that. I think 14, 10, 10, 10 was so simple. So simple, you know, just to add another two teams and and promote teams, and everybody I I, I would have thought been happy. I hope I hope people at the top realise, you know, with all the different suggestions that this is the best one. This is the best one to keep everybody happy, and we move on, and uh, we'll just have to see. Well, well, everybody's in self interest. We know that. We know that. But surely. With the amount of things that are going on just now, you know, you would think that the self-interest bit would be, this is a simple solution, let's go for it and, and let's move on. 
Yeah, uh, I don't know if there is a, a grey door behind you, Rafi. Uh, if you open that grey door, it will take you through to Oz. In fact, there it is. Just that'll take you through to <laughs> Oz. <laughs> just, just out of curiosity, who, who's got a phone? I, that I, have, I know who actually phones people on a phone. It, I have. Is that, that yours, Tam? No, no I've not got. I've not got a house. It's a phone is that, that your phone, rings. Rafi? No, it's a phone that rings when you pick it up. There's nobody on it. It just stops. Yeah. I mean, I'm, when's the last time something? When was the last time Aye. something? When's the last time something? Well, Which one of your birds is it, Ruffy? When's the last time? Honestly. When's the last time your phone rang? Scared, scared, scared to pick it up. Right? Uh, scared to pick it up. Is, all right, John, it, John I'll all, speak up on your letter. Is it, is it all clear, boo boo? <laughs> Oh, God. Brilliant. Oh, dear. Anyway, Ruffy, I was going to ask you a question. I've lost my yes. train of thought because uh, of your stupid well, phone. You yeah. You're, you're, well, you're suggesting something there about. Oh, I, I mean, I, right. I nearly fell off the chair. You're suggesting you need to open the grey door and there's the land of Oz behind you because you're suggesting oh, everybody should look together for the greater good. Have you not just been on this programme for three months witnessing the lunacy? Oh. No, all I'm saying is that if I was making a decision and and right and now I'm being hit with three different uh, solutions. I've been hit with 14, 10, 10, 10. I've been hit with yep. 14, 14, 14. I've been hit with whatever as I've lost the plot in the next one, 14, yeah. 16, 18, whatever. I've had uh, the air boys saying team a league of 20. If I was to put all them into a big bundle, I would say the first one's the easiest solution. Surely. Yeah. Yep. I agree. 14, 10, 10 is from day one. It has to be the best solution. Every, no, nobody's worse what? off. Everybody gets promoted. Nobody gets relegated. It's just simple. Yeah. But, but we're now in a situation where, you know, even when we were in the middle of this madness of coronavirus and people were losing lives, we were all arguing with each other. People were relaying the contents of their calls because they were all colluding, and I include your club in that, Ruffy. Um, and then after that, we had a situation where you wanted reconstruction first. Some people who were suggesting reconstruction were saying, no, it's because you want to save Anne Budge's heart. So uh, they were digging their heels in there and they weren't happy with her attitude. Next minute, in comes the philanthropist and then they question his motives behind it as if there was going to be some kind of prerequisite that hearts hadn't to be relegated. And then, of course, you know, there was clubs calling for suspension of Neil Doncaster. This is what's happened in the last three months. So you thinking that suddenly they're all going to come together, there's no chance. The fighting will continue because there's no real leader out there who can take us forward and say, this is the plan of action. We are just stumbling from one thing to the other. And a lot of it, Tom, is down to the fact that there are some real forces in the SPFL that certainly don't want to give up power and certainly won't, don't want to be dictated to by an independent source. That's why we're all still battering each other over the head like a Tom and Jerry cartoon. Yeah, that, and we go back to Lachlan Cameron. I, I thought he made some great points. He was on your show last month, and he said that one person should be overseeing everything. I think that would make it so much easier, rather than trying to get votes and going round the houses, as you said. One person decides what happens, and that's it. And, uh, you know, I, I'm all for that. Like, like, I'm <coughs> an overseeing a, a CEO or... Because Neil Doncaster's not strong enough to do it, Peter. We all know that. He's, he's, not, he's not got that in the locker. I think you need somebody up there who's going to decide for everybody. Um, because the 11 1 vote as well is just a farce. That's never going to happen. And we could be talking to you this time next year. Reconstruction is not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It's seven yeah. weeks, six, seven weeks to the start of the season. It's no chance. There's no chance of it happening now, in my opinion. Yeah. Yeah, another thing I was going to say to you, uh, Ruffy, with regards to this whole situation is if it doesn't happen, then we are into the waiting to see what Ann Budge's move is with regards to relegation. I'm, I, I know you guys have declared your hand on it, but as far as Ann Budge is concerned, and Alec Kelly and quite a number of other people on Facebook are, are highlighting, look at the, the court ruling in France about relegation was not legal the way they went about it. So this will give or strengthen <coughs> Ann Budge's hand on this. Now, I have my own thoughts on that, but what's your feeling on what comes around with reconstruction dead and buried? 
Well, I've said to you from day one, Peter, we, we've uh, re already resigned that we are in the, the division. We're in Division 1. And if we're in Division 1, then we'll handle it and we'll take it forward. But I do think there's a case for loss of earnings. We've already seen two players jump and ship because they've lost, they went down a division. I think there'll be others. Uh, and most of the, the players that are on might have to take a cut, depending on what kind of contract. So I think there will be a legal challenge about loss of earnings or whatever the, the context or whatever it's called. And I think Anne Budge will go down that road as well. She's talking about £3 million that her club is going to lose because of this. So I don't think she's going to let that go lightly. I think I think yeah. the, the court case about sorting the relegation, as you said there, the clubs have voted for it. I, I think that's a long, long fight. That's a lot of money. But I think if you go for the, the, the loss of earnings thing, they, they seriously have to look at it. Remember right at day one, John Nelms up at Dundee said he had supposedly spoke to people who were going to reimburse any team that was going to be caught financially out of that. That's went out of the window now as well. So... Uh, it's an, and that's an interesting one. It just, I think it all boils down to money. Uh, but I think Ann Budge is the one that's going to take it the whole the whole road because that, that is an awful lot of money. And they're going to be hit with the players as well. They're going to have players who are going to be leaving. So, I mean, I think you have to sit down and weigh up the whole situation. Ruffy, Ruffy, Peter, do you like, can I just add that, you know, we're talking about Hearts getting relegated. I think there'd be a benefit for Hearts dropping in the championship, and the benefit obviously wouldn't be financial, but it would be getting rid of the dross they've got. You know, they'd get, amount, they'd get rid of some amount of players, they'd be able to rebuild, they'd come straight back up within a season, and I understand they're going to lose a lot of money if they get relegated, but I think they could go down and come back up a stronger club all round. I think they'll be able to get rid of players uh, who they're not wanting anyway, who are maybe stuck on contracts if they get a relegation clause or whatever. So I think there is an upside to Hearts getting relegated. I understand they don't want to go down um, because of the financial, you know, get a big hit, but there is an upside for it, I think, Peter, and it would be getting rid of and stripping that club down and rebuilding it again. Yeah, trust you to muddy the waters on an issue that is already unclear. You know, uh, <laughs> you've, you've, t you've, you're like Ruffy, you've taken it on a twist that shouldn't be there. Listen, you've just said to everybody, in your deepest, darkest despair, there's a shaft of light that you can hold on to. Hang fire, boys, honestly. If anything, uh, there, are, there are a number of uh, issues to happen before we get to Anne Budge going to court. A lot of wa water has to go under the bridge today. If it comes out over the course of the next couple of hours that both reconstruction plans uh, or any other one that comes into play uh, has been kicked out and we go with the status quo, then Ann Budge will obviously look at her legal situation. If she does it, if she takes the SPFL to court, that will be frowned upon by UEFA because they don't like member clubs taking their own home nations to court. Ann Budge might say, well, I don't really give a damn. Some people are looking at the relegation issue with France and saying, well, that gives her, a, a, you know, a, strengthens her case in some way. Not necessarily. We do not know what the rules and the process was in France that relegated them and if they adhered to all the rules of a vote which would accept that people couldn't finish their league, teams couldn't finish, so PSG will be champions and whoever will be relegated. So... The SPFL will obviously look at their legal situation and say, did we follow the protocol to get it to a situation where the league couldn't be finished and everybody had to vote on what their predicament would be? That will be their saving grace on this. So there's all sorts of legal minefields there. And of course, if she does take them to court, and Ruffy rightly points it out, will that in some way halt the, pro the process of starting the season on August the 1st? And I think there's a lot of phone calls and a lot of wheelers, wheeling and dealing, shall I say, Tam, before we even get to stopping the league. Before we get to stopping the league, Tam. Yeah, sorry, Peter, I just lost me for a minute there. I, I, didn't, I didn't catch the end of your... What you'd said there, so well, I, 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 th I think before she goes through the whole process, there's a lot of wheeling dealing yeah. to go on before we get to freezing at the start of the Premiership. Yeah, absolutely, Peter. There's, there's a lot to go on. Um, 
You know, and I think Anne will take it the whole way. I think she has to. I think the heart supporters will demand that she takes it the whole way. Um, they, they obviously feel very hard done by. And, and, and I've been consistent. I say it, I it feels as if I say it every week that I don't think Hearts should be relegated. The season wasn't finished. There was still 24 <coughs> points to play for. I don't think there should have been any relegation in any of the leagues, to be honest. And uh, and they, they rightfully sh should fight it the whole way. But, you know, I, I, I just don't think it's they're going to win the case. I think the clubs have voted. If they vote again today for no reconstruction, you know, you know, it's the second time they've voted for it. You know, I just don't see it. I think this is the end. If they come back today and there's no reconstruction, I think Anne's got to go down the road of financial compensation and not reconstruction of the leagues because I think that'll be dead in the water. But she might get some money, um, obviously, for being for compensation wise. Yep, absolutely. Uh, and don't forget, if you at this point want to take a little break for a Campari and Coke, why not do what Ruffy does? Throw the ice in the glass and then just have a little sip of it while we're all falling off. <laughs> while we're all falling off here. <laughs> I love he, he waits till he picks a moment when you're on a rant. <laughs> and then he has a big oh, slug. You actually have a drink <laughs> thinking that I'm not, I'm not on here. That's why no, I'm doing it. Ruffy, what's, what's in it? Ruffy. It's a set forward what soda is? and lime. Yeah. That's a gin and tonic. No chance. I am terrible. Right. I know him. I Aye. honestly, I know him. Stop. I used to run him. I used to run him home from the early days, and he'd have a wee gin and tonic to him, and a, 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 a lager or a Guinness, and that was just to get him ready for dinner. I mean, honestly, <laughs> you know, and I don't know how he survives. He, he, he is. He's the Keith Richards of the football world. He defies medical science. Yes, it's, it's magnificent. Um, Listen, the other thing I was going to say to you guys is lots of things that we want to talk about. One-to-one -one, uh, coming up as well. We're going to give a lot of people a mention um, uh, who are joining us up here. And Ronnie Blythe says, it's a bit of a mess up here. This hasn't been handled well from the start. Ronnie, you are 100% uh, correct. Uh, you're absolutely right on that. Stevie McCormick says, are you selling onions, Tam? Because clearly he feels as if <laughs> you've got some... <laughs> You've, you've that's big Stevie, big in. Stevie McCormack, yeah. the ex striker. I played with him, big bean pole. Yeah, he's always giving me abuse. Him. <laughs> yes, yes. You should, actually, running at his you, you should actually be his friend on Facebook, by the way. He is completely and utterly unhinged. You know, he, he goes in there and does some bro. He does some brilliant stuff on his his uh, his Facebook and his lives uh, as well. He's a good lad, um, good player, Tom. Aye, was I big Stevie? Aye, I seven foot, massive, massive striker. I played him at East Fife yeah. when I was a kid. Me and him were up front, and I'd never done so much running in my life. He did not move. Yeah, well, there you are. That's uh, that's fairly leathered, you Stevie. <laughs> so, <laughs> so on that note, <laughs> uh, let's look at some of the other little quick stories that I want to get your thoughts on. Uh, tough guidelines. Um, well, the first one, Ruffy, is quickly for yourself. FIFA might even extend the transfer window, which you might think to yourself, well, so what? But uh, countries like Scotland, the Netherlands, and Belgium, that will leave them open to the bigger clubs still cherry-picking their players yeah. late into the to the start of the new season. Yeah, well, we've already touched on a couple of our players, particularly the Rangers and Celtic players. You know, we thought uh, Edison Edward was going to, would be happy to stay, would be happy because there wouldn't be any clubs uh, really going out and bidding for these players. So that opens that window a wee bit, but I still think the valuation of the players won't be the same as what it was before all this kicked in. So I, I would think that the clubs would be more than happy to try and persuade their top players to sit it out for another year. And and hopefully that these guys are quite happy with that if they're well looked after, obviously. Yeah. Um, can I just say a big hello to everyone, uh, Davey Anderson and Michael uh, Michael uh, McKinney, McKinney on um, YouTube as well. And Jim Stevenson points out, remember, the EFL have called their league. So that might also give the SBFL uh, a little bit of clout in this argument as well. So there's lots of people uh, obviously putting their uh, point of view across. Kenneth McFarlane says, I just want to ask Tam, Kevin McFarlane says, can I ask Tam if he has any special special Hibs memorabilia that you kept or did the kit man Tam make sure you couldn't take any of it away with you um, there you are he knows Tam too well uh, I try to think I've got, I've got a couple of strips Peter but I've, honestly I've never kept a lot of stuff um, I gave all my stuff away I've, I've, I was very very generous yeah. when I was younger and I wish I'd kept a lot of my strips um, I've got a cup, a cup final against Livingston 
but we lost. Yeah. Um, I've got that. I've got that. Still got that strip, but not a lot. Programs and stuff like that. But I've not got a lot of rehabs. Yeah. Memorabilia, no. What about the yellow strip where you hit the volley at Ibrox? Have you, did you have to sell that one because you'd obviously realised you'd Rangers people <laughs> in your family? <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I don't know where that strip is. I don't know where that strip is. But, uh, aye, oh, that, right, okay. uh, that upset a few Rangers supporters in my family, I suppose. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Uh, Martin Boy says, Hi, guys. I'm tuning in again from Thailand. It's becoming a ritual watching and listening to you guys. I love the show. Keep up the good work. Uh, and I think that's nice, Ruffy, that so many people from right across the globe are tuning in. We ask, and I'm not going to be, uh, you know, in any way conceited about this, Ruffy. I'm just going to try and be reserved and show a bit of humility. We are Scotland's biggest football show because the figures are there. Monday to Friday, people are tuning in from all over the place, just joining in because they love their football. Football. Uh, and of course the ones who say this is the show for them Ruffy are the ones who are tuning in in great numbers yeah it's fantastic that they're coming from uh, all over the place you know and uh, obviously the boy from Thailand he, he phones quite a lot uh, uh, it's a very sociable place to go to I've been there a couple of times very nice people uh, like to mix uh, so that's that is lovely <laughs> <laughs> honestly, honestly, I can't. I can't. There's no point. There's, I know. You, know, you know what we should do? It's just a, it's just a dirty old man. He's just filthy old man. <laughs> honestly, it really is. He stopped we should, talking you know about the scenery. She is too. Yeah, the Tom, we should put a red triangle. We should put a red triangle at the bottom of Ruffy's of Ruffy's picture. Parental guidance that comes with a, That's exactly it, Tom. I don't know about you. I don't know about you, Tom. But you, when we were when we were kids, Channel Four would have a red triangle at the bottom mm. of some of the programs, which meant they were a wee bit dodgy. And if you were a teenager, mm. you thought to yourself, "Oof, oof right. I'm going to get to watch this until your mum clipped you around the ear and yeah. sent you up to bed." Was that, that yeah, my dad. In your house, Tom? <laughs> yeah, my dad. My dad actually. Yes, did. Uh, my, my, my dad uh, sent us to bed when Benny Hill came on. <laughs> I couldn't watch Benny Hill. <laughs> <laughs> I can understand that, Ruffy. Um, anyway, apart from anything else, it was good to see uh, people. Uh, and and David Russell David Russell brings us all right back down to earth with a bag. He says, let's be honest, lads. There's nothing else on. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's, that's not true. Good point. Just, good just point. when we thought we were getting, just when we thought we were getting a compliment. Peter, uh, did, yeah. Peter, the thing is, a lot of people are enjoying the show and writing on the, but we we enjoy doing the show as well. It's great for us. It gives us something oh. to do because we've not got a lot of stuff to do either. I mean, me, I've got nothing to do during the day, so I look forward oh. to a Wednesday and a Friday when I'm on, and I'm sure the the people who are watching it look forward to to watching it and tuning in. It gives them a wee hour and a half for getting away for the. For the, for the crap, the coronavirus. Yeah, absolutely. The other thing about it as well, Tom, I don't know about you, but as I've mentioned on this programme, I've started roughly opening boxes and I'm finding photographs from yesteryear that I'm just sharing with all the family and there's some absolute belters. I mean, you were worried about your haircut last week, Tom. Some of the photographs I've been finding, I mean, honestly, we, <laughs> I, sh I, should have been, I should have been heading to social services to get them to help me <laughs> with some of the mad haircuts I had, to be honest with you. Um, also, um, something else that happened, uh, Ruffy, is an interesting one. Oh, somebody, somebody. Can we hold on? I've got, I've got a delivery at <laughs> the door. <Can> you just... <laughs> It's a bit, it's a bit <laughs> early for your curry. It's, 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 it's unbelievable, honestly. He's got people jabbing the door. He's got the phone <laughs> ringing. And, uh, of course, th what's happened is that's Elsie thinking you'd given him the sign <laughs> and the old clear. So she's she's come to the door unannounced. <laughs> Singer. didn't answer the phone. But yeah, Singer, that was her name. <clears throat> Tom. Um, yes. Sure, Kettle well, Tom. Give us your thoughts on that because he's now taken over as the sole manager. Stephen Ferguson's going to be the chief executive. And Richie Britton, uh, and also Don Cowie, who retired from Hearts. Don Cowie's gone up as first team coach to Ross County. So they've got their team in place. I can understand what Roy McGregor's doing. He's just continuing that family feel. Yeah, yep, yep, yeah, it certainly has. And Ross County are very innovative in the way they go about their business. You know they've they've put obviously Ferguson up, and uh, I think Scott Boyd was the was the CEO. He left, and Richie Britton stepped in as assistant manager. They all know the club inside out. Don Cowie was there for years as well. You know they know Ross County, and uh, Roy McGregor feels he can trust them. So 
they're always a club I think do things properly anyway, and uh, they've got a great training training setup up there, great facilities, and uh, Roy McGregor's obviously a wealthy man that's put a lot of money in, but you know I think it it, it augurs well for them for the future. I know Liam Fontaine, uh, he's taking his coaching badges and is in charge of the reserves, so they've got a lot of youth up there in charge of. Of, of really important positions, a lot of young guys. So um, I think it's important for them going forward that they've got that that youth and the, you know a wee bit of experience as well. Yeah, absolutely. A good club. I like Roy McGregor. Ruffy, when we uh, had the yeah. commentary, and we, we would go, we would go up there. He was always really nice to us. Yeah, he would show us around the place. He, he he takes great privilege in letting everybody know what they're doing, seeing their training facilities and everything that goes on. Everybody just looks at the actual stadium itself. They don't know what's going on behind the stadium and the facilities they've got. And you're right. And and as, as Tam said, they, they were one of the first ones to buy the testing. You know, he wasn't messing about and he was quite prepared to share it out with some of the, the, the other clubs up there. So, no, well done to him. You know, he's got so very well organised. Was I not reading people that he's actually shipped a couple of people over, you know, to do the testing? Uh, I think yeah, I was reading in the papers. He's... He's going to share yeah, he's it and got give a access to everybody in the community. No, no but he's actually got, uh, he's brought over a, through his business a couple of people from the Far East, you know, to do the testing because uh, they've yeah. done it over there and they're, they're way ahead of even the, the top clubs in Scotland. Mm. Oh, they're fantastic. Yeah, yep, absolutely. And I, I know the other machine, uh, I think Celtic um, have purchased it and their players will go back tomorrow under very tough guidelines. And I think that's going back to what Ian Maxwell was saying in the letter to the clubs yesterday. You've got to pay attention. You've got to stick to the strict guidelines here or there's no chance we're getting back on August 1st. Um, interestingly enough, there's lots of other things that I want to get your thoughts on, lads, uh, as well. Some thorny subjects. Stephen Smith says, uh, Peter, if you get a chance, share some of those uh, bits of uh, memorabilia, maybe the, maybe the pictures as well. Uh, love to see the stuff you have. Yeah, I mean, I don't know about you, Tam, but I mean, I have to be honest with you, I'm a hoarder. And when I was a kid, I just, you know, I love football that much. I, I you know, I showed the Panini sticker albums that I have. I've got the, the full 74 one, the full 1982 sticker album, complete with all the stickers in it, Tam. Um, I collected Roy the Rovers, uh, 442 magazines. I don't know about you, uh, the shoot. I mean, I don't know about you, Tam, and I made scrapbooks. Were you that sort of shoot. football fanatic, or were you, or were you just? Um, did you say shoot there or something else? <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I did. Peter, I, I, I spent most of my time out playing. To be honest, I don't know what you were doing, just sitting in your room, with your sticker book. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> no, I was out. I was I out wasn't. playing, but I did collect. <laughs> yeah. I think my first one was Italian ninety. Uh, I was, I'd have been nine year old. Um, that was the first kind of full complete book that I. That, that I filled in. Uh, Toto Scalacci was my was my favourite, and uh, the great German team there, Los Amateurs. So that was my first real experience of, of collecting stickers and all that. But I, I was like you. I, I would go to school and I would I would swap my, my pals for a sticker for, for a doubler and stuff like that. So yeah, I was yeah. Not, not quite as much as you, but I was a keen collector of, of stuff like that. Yeah, but remember Ruffy as well. I mean, uh, you know, you know yourself that I, uh, you know, I played football uh, every godsend hour. But the hours that I couldn't play football, Ruffy. Uh, you know, I would, I would obviously collect things, but I didn't you know. Like Tam doesn't doesn't watch telly. What else do you not do that caught us all yeah. by surprise, Tam? What was the other thing you said the other day there that we all fell off the chair? What was it that you didn't do that we couldn't believe? I've never been to a concert. Can you remember? A That's concert. what it was, Rocky. Yeah. It's never been to a concert. No, I, a concert. Uh, no, I can't believe that. I, I was I was also going to buy the. I was going to do the seventy eight uh, Panini World Cup one and the eighty two. Panini World Cup one, but I said to myself, "What what what's the point when you're you're already there, you know?" Yeah, yeah, there's no point in buying stickers <laughs> of yourself. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, but some would argue, "What are you, what are you really there?" <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. To be fair, Ruffy, you could have actually the you could have got the nineteen. Yeah, you could have got the nineteen eighty six oh. Panini sticker album because you weren't doing anything at that World Cup. You were sitting no, on no, the bench with no. Graham Sharp. No. Yes, me and Sharp we could have. <laughs> There are a few things over there. Yeah, somebody <laughs> pointed this out to me, Ruffy. Did Jim, don't bite, don't bite, Tom. Uh, no. Did Jim Leighton go to four World Cups? Was Jim Leighton involved in four? Oh. Oh, you know how he could have been a, young, he uh, been a uh, youngster just taken to one as the kit boy or something like that, or, you know, or just to get the experience. That's a I good question. That. Uh, 
I don't know the answer to that, to tell you the truth. Yeah. But uh, if he was it for, uh, I really, I, I, just, I just can't really imagine who shared the room with him for the three weeks. It must have been riveting. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. That's a good, you know, that's, that's he is choking cheese to rough he? He's he's, uh, absolutely, by the way. That's Ruffy just a good professional family man, and Ruffy just kind him. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Of course, of course. I have to tell you, there was a situation where there's a great story where Ruffy actually locked him in the cupboard in the room. But that's not for publication on this one. Let me yes. tell you. Um, let, let, let me let me. Let me ask you this, uh, Ruffy. Uh, John Barnes came out, and I thought it was a great uh, situation that John Barnes uh, mentioned, which is quite simply, uh, he believes... Um, oh, wait a minute. Just, I'm just going to mention something here. I, 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 he believes that... Um, <laughs> That black players and black managers, well, black managers were given less time to succeed. He wasn't critical of his time in Scotland because obviously, you know, he realised what the pressures were of being the Celtic manager. But he, he reckons overall in, in, in the UK, um, black managers were given less time to succeed. You know, John Barnes for me is is a shining light at times on the situation with uh, trying to give more black and ethnic minorities opportunities in football and how we need to address it. I think we constantly sweep it under the carpet. What's your take on what he had to say there? Yeah, well, obviously, Peter, I'm certainly not in a position to, to back that up. If he thinks that, he's, he's the one that's probably applied for jobs or interviews and not got them. Uh, it'd be really interesting for somebody to show you the stats, not just in Britain, but through the world, France, Italy, Spain. You know, I don't know how many, you know, the many managers get a chance in these countries. I, I, I honestly don't know the answer to it. But if he's saying it and other people are saying it, then it must have happened to them personally. I, I certainly, I mean, we just have to look at the managers throughout the whole of, of Britain. And there isn't, there isn't a lot, you know, so maybe there is a reason. Uh, I, I wouldn't like to really 100% put my my foot in it and say why it is or why why it isn't but uh, as an individual you must have went through these scenarios uh, when you're applying for jobs well it's not just in the united kingdom it's not just in england it's in scotland because we had he was a regular pundit on our program uh time with kevin harper um now yeah. kevin's a friend of mine and he, he came on before he got the albion rovers job uh, and he was a regular on our programme, and he was also, he's been reiterating it today on Sky Sports, but it's something that he said on PLZ Soccer, which is quite simply, he couldn't get a job. Now, at yeah. the end of the day, you say, okay, did you try hard enough? <clears throat> the answer to that is, I know, yes, he applied for so many jobs right across all the divisions, mainly the lower leagues, because he didn't have delusions of grandeur that he was going to drop into a top job. But out of 42 clubs, you know, he sent away to a lot of clubs an application for jobs that were available. He's had one reply um, for an interview and he got the Albion Rovers job. Now, there's something wrong. Yeah, I think it, I think I agree with Ruffy. You've got to take the, the guys at face value. These are the guys that are applying for jobs and putting their name forward for things and never getting a, never getting a chance to even <coughs> interview for them. You know, and I, and I listen to Kevin, and I know Kevin, I respect Kevin. Uh, I think they've done a good job at Albion Rovers as well. You know, I think they've, they've yeah. got a very, very, very low budget. And uh, it'll be interesting to see if Kevin can get back into the game. Um, because I think, as I said, they've done a good job. He'll be applying for jobs. And I should just have to look at the number. There isn't a lot of black managers in. You know, I think Kevin was only one in Scotland. At one point in England, there wasn't that many either. Maybe a handful. So I think it's, it's something that's got to be looked into. Um, if these guys are continually applying for jobs and they're not even getting an interview and they're qualified and if they've got qualifications they've done a good job elsewhere and you know maybe a good, good career as, as a player and they're not even getting a sniff of an interview you have got to look into that closely I think Peter so I, I would agree with Kevin Yeah well, well my attitude to it Ruffy is and I'm talking <laughs> about what's been happening over the last week instead of tearing down statues we should be breaking down barriers to give black people and ethnic minorities the opportunities. We should be investing in their community, we should be listening to them, and we should be giving them those opportunities. That's my attitude to it, instead of this tokenism of tearing down statues and words which 
don't really solve the problem, Ruffy. No, they don't. You know, the, and and we've been battering on about it in our show, you know, show racing the red card. You know, we've been doing it, and you have to keep making people aware of it. Uh, and I thought for I thought for a minute. Well, we're getting better and better and better, and then it raises its ugly head again. And uh, but we still doesn't mean we have to stop doing it. We have to start preaching to. I think it's the the youth of today. It's them coming up and growing up. They're the ones, same as religion. You know, they're the ones that we should be really hammering them at them that this is the way the future is. It's because it's their future. You know, and if if we don't realise, you know, that nothing's getting done about it, then it's going to be uh, a bad place to be. Yeah, I'm sure there's lots of people with, uh, you know, lots of comments to make on it. It is a thorny subject. Some people don't like discussing it, but it's something that I think we need to address with actions rather than words um, and symbols here and there. Um, it needs action. It needs investment. It needs also people to listen uh, to what the problems are and then act on them. Anyway, apart from that... Um, that's one of the aspects of society we have to worry about and sport we have to worry about. Um, we also have to worry about the fact that we're arguing with each other non-stop, battering each other, can't even can't even get ourselves together for what should be uh, a new season. We don't even know what size the league's going to be. Um, it's incredible. We don't even know if some teams are actually going to be in that league or whether we're going to be going to court. Uh, there you are. It's just, uh, as somebody said to me <coughs> on the phone today, any good news? Um, so Rod Strother uh, is out there and he says to me, hi guys, I'm watching in uh, Singapore. Any chance of a wee shout out to the president, Rory Brown, of our football club, which is the Singapore Hibernians. It's his 40th. So uh, Rod says, much appreciated if you get the time to do that. 40 years of age, Singapore Hibernians, which is absolutely magnificent. You know, it's the one thing, I don't know if I've got another year in me playing rotten football somewhere, but I love the fact that people play for as long as they possibly can. Ruffy, you played till you're 39. Uh, maybe, was it later than that, Ruffy, or was it 39? 39. 39, yeah. yeah. Tam, you should have played longer. I just, I, I mean, I just love playing even when I'm unbelievably ranked rotten I still love playing 11s picking fights with people on the park fives <laughs> picking fights tennis picking fights seems to be a <laughs> seems to be a theme with me but nevertheless I still love it Tom yeah as I say that it was it's just unfortunate for me my, my Achilles tendon was was knackered you know I was in I could hardly walk yeah. walk to the toilet and brush my teeth in the morning after after training and playing when I was 32 33 so Run about then, I knew I knew I was done. But uh, I still enjoy a little game of fives, even if I've, I'm in a bit of pain after it, or, or over thirty-five. Sometimes we used I sometimes get a few games of them. So um, I still enjoy it. I just I just don't enjoy the pain after it or uh, getting up the next morning. But I think that's just the joy of football when you get older. Well, you're going to have to take the pain because Barry suggested to me uh, uh, an electrician, <coughs> uh, a tradesman, who was going to come in and fix something for me in the house, Tom. Uh, and he came in yesterday and he said, I've been talking to Barry and, uh, you know, he is absolutely desperate with Tom McManus to batter you and Ruffy at tennis. And I could not <laughs> stop laughing, Ruffy. I could not <laughs> stop laughing because I thought to myself, those two idiots will be lucky to get a game, Ruffy. They are going <laughs> to have to go for extensive training before they even yeah. get a game off his Ruffy. And he said, yeah, no, I think... Bar ba Barry's a winner. He'll be desperate to win. And I thought, yeah. oh. <laughs> well, I remember. Uh, uh, well, did, did you play in the? I think you did, Peter. Did you play in the last challenge match with Jerry Britton and Gary Caldwell? Uh, did you play Jerry Britton and, and play Jerry Britton no, and uh, Gary no, Caldwell. No, you cut us out of that, Ruffy. We were desperate to to, oh. to play. You, you cut me out oh, for Senga. Um, I think. I think I played that day. Was, was, <laughs> was, uh, it was, was the Helga, though. No, no, no. So, so uh, yeah, there's been a, well, there's, that, that's the worst. The worst. If you get, uh, if Tom gets a chance to ask Jerry Britton how that game went, then uh, that'll be an eye opener for you. Yeah, uh, I'll Brilliant. ask Big Jerry. Brilliant. How, how, how yes, can Big Jerry um, get rid of the coat with that big massive heat anyway? He really tips there to one side. Well, that's the how he keeps lobbing, keeps yeah. lobbing them. 
<laughs> just to get it back in court. <laughs> Keeps lobbing his head. Uh, James, James Scullion says to me, I played it up until I was 39 until you done me in a friendly, Peter, when you were playing for Dukla. <laughs> I played for Kevin 35s and I've still got the scars, says James. Scathing stuff, to be perfectly honest with you, um, but true. Um, anyway, apart from anything else, um, I'm, I'm just looking here. Ruffy, what were you doing on this day in 2017? Do you remember what you were doing? 2017. No, no. On that, no. on this very day, Ruffy. Um, and I don't know. It could have been three years and ago. And it could have been round about this three years ago. At this day, it might have been just about half an hour ago. Um, you were with me. Do you remember that, June. Ruffy? Can you remember three years ago, June 2017, uh, Ruffy? Was that a was that a Scotland England game? Yes, yes, Ruffy. Yes, we, we were did cuddling. The light, light. We were yes, cuddling each yes, other. We yeah, we were going mental when Lee Griffiths hit the first one. Oh. We were going absolutely tonto when he hit the second one, second and we were thinking one. to ourselves, "Yeah, dancer, we're going to beat England." Everybody was going crazy, and then yeah. hurricane. <laughs> yeah, and we were Glory we were failure. right. We were we we were just at the the track side just at the side of the goal um, and obviously Armstrong should have passed it one way and never and we were right in line of that ball came over. do you remember it Pierre it came right over oh. and you went oh, somebody's going to somebody's going to win that Craig Gordon's going to get it and then it went in and it was just yeah. it was just amazing it was just oh Sam, apart from it, I think he's. I think we're all unkind uh, and I, I include myself in this I think we're all unkind suggesting look Stuart Armstrong uh, is at fault for not just punting the ball into the corner and we would have won the match 2-1. That's unkind because at that point, I remember, the ball was still in their half. We could still defend yeah. a ball that was in their half. And the one thing that was going through my head, Tom, is I saw the ball being launched in a 50-yard diagonal. The only Keep thing us. that was going through my head, <laughs> even better than that, Tom, I'm standing next to Ruffy and I'm saying, Okay, Craig, this is your chance to take the ball and take Harry Kane out as well. Smash him and smash the ball and make sure that the ball's as far away as possible. That was the only thing in my head. And I don't know about you, what yeah, was, it was. through your mind? No, it was. I was actually in America. I was at a coaching camp in Georgia. I was watching it with the campers, our American kids, and they were thinking Scotland were some team. I kept saying, nah, we've we, we, we got hammered today. They're going, Scotland, they're going 2 1. And uh, I can remember I watched it on a big screen with, with all the kids, and I was, I think I threw a water bottle off the screen. I, I was absolutely raging. You know, Craig Gordon should have came and got it. You know, Armstrong. There's a, listen, there's little things that you just got to, you've got to see the game out when you go 2 1 up. Just see it out, you know, be professional and see it out. I mean, we just made a couple of slight mistakes, and, and it cost us daily, but. Lee Griffiths, I mean, two two unbelievable oh. free kicks. I mean, the noise, the noise in Hamden that, that day must have been outrageous. It must have been the roof must have nearly come off the second goal, particularly. Uh, Tam, I, I tell you right now, you'll never believe it. <coughs> the team, <coughs> excuse me, the team we had that day for STV covering that match, we had me, Ruffy, Chris Commons, and Kenny Miller, and we were over in, in the area which would traditionally be the Celtic end, um, where Ke Harry Kane scored. And Ruffy and me and Kenny Miller and Chris Commons were literally jumping on each other's heads, cuddling each other. Ruffy, it was me I mean, the the, the noise it, it was it was unbelievable, it wasn't was. it? Yeah, I don't I don't know if you remember that day, Peter. That as you said, there the, we were designated to be just at the corner of the Celtic end of the 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 stadium. And I don't know if you know this, but Sky Sports uh, they were actually right behind the goal, and it was Graham Souness. And uh, Graham Souness actually said to the production boy, is there any chance we could move a wee bit round the corner <laughs> instead of just being at this end? <laughs> yeah. The whole of Sky Sports had to move nearly right round the whole stadium. Ah, uh, yeah, it was, uh, it was a great game. It was... Uh... Sensational, to be perfectly honest with you. Absolutely magnificent. Thoroughly enjoyed it. Great day, but, you know, in the end, we didn't get the, the result we were looking for. Um, so, with that in mind, um, you know, uh, Tam, 
you've got to you've got to have order with your dad for Friday. You know, we really need yeah, to absolutely. pull yeah. pull out all the stops, Tom. It'll be great to see even one or two of your strips. By the way, uh, I know you sent <laughs> me a video today, a YouTube of your best bits, Tom. You mm -hmm. scored some absolute rakers. One of the goals you scored, I think, for Colorado Rapids um, was an absolute ticker. Yeah, it was. Um, actually beat David Beckham uh, to goal of the year in the MLS that season. So uh, he, he scored from his own half, similar to done against Man United. So my goal beat him. So I think that was something to do with my mum and dad. Uh, phone bill being about three grand that month. But um, it was great to beat him. Uh, and I, I love my time in America, even when I went to Rochester, New York. You know, it was a great experience over a rough equipment in America as well. It's a great country to go and play football. You go and travel about in the weather how, and the facilities were tremendous. Did, Tom, how did you get there? How did you get to Colorado? Was it a Scottish uh, connection? It was, um, I was at Dunfermline at the time. We'd just been relegated from the, the SPL under under Stephen Kenny. And and uh, they were trying to cut the wages. I had, I had another year and a half left and I was on decent money. And, and there's a guy, John Murphy, who... Is Amer he was born in Scotland, but he's American. He, he was a, I don't know if you remember, he was a manager of Livingston, very, very briefly. Um, he was a manager of Livingston. He, he was the assistant manager at Colorado Rapids. And um, he got in contact with my agent. And uh, I went down to Colorado Rapids and Arsenal, both owned by Stan Kroenke. Um, so they've got they had a connection. Colorado Rapids went over to Arsenal to, to do their pre-season. So luckily for me, it was in January. The, the, their season was March to... To October, so this was about January, February, and I'd been playing, so I was in good shape. I was fit, and I went down to London Colney. We played a, a we played the trial game against Arsenal, right? So it's Colorado Rapids against Arsenal. It's a trial game, and Arsenal had Gilberto playing Van Persie, it was Walcott. It was an international break. They'd no game. <laughs> you want to see the team they do, it, and I, I couldn't believe it. I'm going. There's no chance I'm going to deal with Colorado <laughs> after this. How am I going to get a kick here? They had such a strong team, and we only lost two one. Um, I, th I think some of the players just couldn't be bored with it, but we were obviously right up for it with the names they had in the team sheet. And, and I set up our goal, and, uh, and, I, I, and I played well. And after that, um, I spoke to the manager. We done our game against Ipswich. They had a strong team as well. So I was down there for about a week in trial, and then um, the manager signed me, Yuri Guayan guy, um, signed me, and John Murphy was assistant manager. So that's why I got over to, I got over to the MLS. I, I left them firmly in the January. And over to, I'd never been to America before, ever. And... Uh, Obviously, Colorado's at altitude. It was a mile above sea level, and uh, oh, I couldn't breathe for about a month. It was it was horrible. But uh, no, great, great, great place. Uh, I, I loved it over there. Enough for you playing in America as well. The, the the places you get to go and see. Um, you know, you're playing away from home: Toronto, Chicago, Los Angeles, Seattle. You know, Montreal. You know, you get to fly all over America and Canada. It was it was a brilliant experience for me. Yeah, absolutely. And the video, Ruffy, I've got to pass it on to you tonight. Um, yeah. If you think the hair, if you think the haircut he's got now is a bad one, uh, he was padding about with the long hair down his back. Uh, I mean, honestly, he looked like uh, you know. Have you ever seen the movie Robin Hood, Men in Tights? That's, ex right. that's exactly what it looked like. So I'm going to pass that on to you. Anyway, apart from anything else, uh, lots of uh, people have been uh, joining us. Don't forget to subscribe to our channel if you get a chance. Like, share and follow on our Facebook. We're on Periscope uh, at PLZ Soccer on Twitter as well. And you get the podcast too. We hope you enjoy uh, the programme as ever with Tam, Ruffy and myself. And also earlier today, uh, some great listeners now I caught up with our special guest Sean Maloney. Well I'm delighted to say our special guest on the football show today is former Celtic midfielder, striker, master of all trades Sean Maloney. Sean I'm delighted that you uh, can join us. Of course your new uh, role is the assistant to Roberto in the uh, Belgium international squad. First of all how are you keeping? Are you safe and well? Yeah no I'm um... Myself and family all good, so I uh, definitely feel quite fortunate. So, yeah, thanks for asking. Uh, I had a look at the old CV e even before we get on air, and I thought to myself, wow, five Scottish Cups, five league titles, three league Cups, an FA Cup. Uh, I mean, it's some haul of silverware that you managed to accrue. Do you, do you look back? Are you nostalgic about that? Is that something you do, or do you just put that in the past and keep moving forward? Um, no, I really, I think some of them aren't quite correct because uh, I was definitely injured for a fair part of them. Um, but no, generally just, um, no, I don't really look back too much. Um, I think there was a few weeks ago, 
uh, Roberto actually messaged to say that the, the FA Cup final was on. So um, I think it was on YouTube, I think. So I ended up watching about the last half hour of that. Um, but generally, no, I don't I don't watch the games, uh, uh, previous games too much, no. Okay, I might have got the medals wrong. Do you look at the ones that you did win? <laughs> <laughs> um, no, no, not really, no. No? No, uh, no. Um, no, it's all sort of just the. I know, I know. Obviously, things have stopped with the football and life in general. But um, I suppose generally now, as as the coach, I tend to look back at the games that we've just had. Um, I think maybe that's that's more. Um, well, it's more relevant now. But no, I don't tend to watch the games that I played in. Uh, maybe I should. Yeah, you're planning for the future. You obviously you're taking your badges um, with real ambition. I would imagine to be a coach in your own right one day. Um, do you know what I had? I had that plan when I joined Celtic Academy to um, definitely go down that route of being a head coach. Um, but I think after Roberto took me to Belgium, um, and the last two years, it's um, that was definitely not part of the, the career path I had envisioned. Envisioned even um, so, may, maybe one day, but it's it's definitely not something I'm thinking about just now. It's a strange situation because if uh, if I had said to you while I was handing over the PFA Player and Young Player of the Year award to you, by the way, you'll be Long the Belgium assistant. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, by the way, Sean, you'll be the Belgium assistant manager one day. You'd have looked at me as if it was a complete <laughs> nutcase. <laughs> yeah, no, probably. Uh, I think if you'd um, probably said that to me only two or three years ago, I would have said the same thing. It was, uh, look, it came completely out of the blue, was not something that I'd planned. Um, I definitely had the sort of path or a plan that I thought I was going to go down. Um, and then that phone call just completely changed all of that. Um, so, yeah, very fortunate. Uh, yeah, I do understand the, the sort of role that I'm in and, and how fortunate I was to get that chance so early. Did you, did you feel a little bit, um, well, it was a surreal situation you were in when you were sitting in that Belgium bench uh, watching, you know, the stars dismantle Scotland? Um. Yeah, yeah, I think the game was probably the game. The game was a a little bit strange in terms of just when the anthems went that first match. Um, but it was really those first few days with the camp were um, were I wouldn't say difficult, but they were very. It was really different scenario than. Um, I was fortunate that uh, Thierry was still there. That was a big sort of bonus. Um, so it was Roberto Thierry and myself. So I could. It was. Um, it was a sort of gentle introduction with with those two, but obviously Terry left after about six weeks. So, um, but I was fortunate that there was there was sort of um, a number two at that point when I first joined, because um, it was a a big step from obviously Celtic Academy straight to um, they had the Belgium main squad. Yeah, absolutely, and and of course uh, your association with Roberto Wigan FA Cup, all of that. Um, but um, were you surprised when you got the call? Um, yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, I texted him a few times during the, the World Cup campaign. Um, and then the phone call uh, was, yeah, what he, what, what he then offered and the phone call was completely out of the blue, uh, complete surprise. Um, uh, Dedrick uh, was still at Celtic at the time. So the, the initial phone call I thought was going to be regarding Dedrick and, and the start of it was. And, um, and then obviously... Uh, yeah, with the with the job offer was uh, was not something I planned. No. Yeah, uh, I've got to pick your brains here on this one. Uh, I mean, when you're in there now and you watch how they train, um, the world stars that they have, what is there a is there a vast difference? Uh, I mean, I can hear Bill Shankly saying football is a simple a simple game, you know, and Johan Cruyff says football is a a simple game complicated by players. Give me an insight into <laughs> Sean, Sean, Sean Sean Maloney playing for Scotland and training with Scotland, all your managers, and suddenly you've got a team that people actually expected at one point to win the European Championships and the World Cup. Yeah, no, it's 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 really difficult to just sort of narrow down to one sort of aspect that's um that like really does impress you because I think there's there's numerous um you could it's literally everything you go through in terms of like the technical ability um uh, and not so much physically yeah obviously amazing physically but I think you can get that through any sort of um, uh, country and and sort of club. Um, tactically, definitely, uh, that was one thing I noticed. They were very, the, the squads very adapt to picking up um, 
tactical ideas uh, that the manager and staff have. And probably, well, may maybe the biggest is the probably the mentality. So every day within training, whether the, the, the pitch is immaculate or whether we have to train somewhere else in a different country, the, the mentality never changes. Um, just incredibly professional and just just very dedicated to the to the sort of role and the work that they do. And the, the mentality would be the probably the biggest difference um, or the biggest sort of shock that I had. Uh, and it's still it's still something that impresses me even now, two years down the road. Yeah, and the the, the sixty four thousand dollar question here, Sean, is how in the hell did they manage to get a golden generation like that? I mean, I, I buy into your technique, I buy into the training and the mentality, but <laughs> is, have you ever sat down with Roberto and said, look, write this down on a little bit of paper so that we can somehow replicate it for Scotland? No, it's, you see, this is where I'm, I'm, I, I slightly disagree it, about the generation. Um, so you, it seems like it's, Seems like it's more than one generation. Um, there is obviously within it's it's so many. So you, you see different age groups within our squad. If you really go through it, you you have the the companies from Allen that are just incredible elite players. But then even the next generation, in terms of age wise, you have Bitzel, uh, De Bruyne, Hazard, go a bit past that, and and you're only talking like maybe a year, two years, three years. You're looking, you've got. Uh, Lukaku, um, um, you have Mounier, uh, Courtois, and even below that, you and I'm missing players' names out here, but you go down again and you have the Tillemans age, Dennis Pratt, Castagna, so it doesn't quite feel to me when I'm there that there's just this one generation that there's that pressure. It just feels like it's continuous. Um, and, and now we see there's more 18, 17-year-olds playing within the league that I think over the next two or three years are going to, break into the A squad, maybe even sooner. So the generation thing doesn't, it doesn't feel like it's one generation to me. Well, if it's That's not one generation, it, it, it's a great insight because if it's not one generation, then they must be doing something right in developing these boys from potential to talent and realising it. Yeah, no, 100%. I think that's, um, that's maybe something that has to, other countries, like uh, Scotland, our country is, um, I wouldn't. I'm, I look at the squad now, and I look at the, the the sort of age group of them, and it's it's really positive. I think it's a really strong generation, and Scotland have younger players coming through. Um, obviously, Gilmore's the one that stands out uh, because of how big his performances have been against really top opposition down uh, in the Premier League. So it's not all. Um, I certainly wouldn't be negative on where I feel Scotland is at the moment, and where they're where they're hopefully going to go. Where are you going to go? The the the, pl the path is obviously with Belgium and and suck up as much knowledge as possible, get those badges in place. Um, club management is clearly a step. Do you see yourself being a a manager one day? Um, no, it's similar to what I said previous. I I did, I really did. Um, but then I, now the role that I'm in, um, and the the sort of importance of that role and the sort of uh, I, I feel that when an assistant, particularly when Roberto's taken me from the academy, has, there has to be a certain degree of loyalty. And um, so I don't plan on being a, a club manager or a head coach at the moment. Um, Roberto signed a contract. I think we'll all all do the same. It takes us to the World Cup Doha, and uh, once I sign that, I don't, I, I absolutely don't uh, see myself breaking that contract whatsoever. I admire your loyalty towards uh, Roberto, and I'm sure he'll be appreciative of it. Um, let me ask you this then. Uh, it's not a crime to have ambition to be the coach one day. Yeah, no, I think uh, um, I would love to work back at the club again at some point. Um, yeah, whether that's assistant or any other role, I think it's... Um, uh, yeah, I, I only worked there for a year in the academy. Um, so yeah, if I get the opportunity again to work there in the future, it'd be, yeah, it'd be amazing. You've got a lot of managers that have coached you down through the years. Um, give me an insight into the ones that inspired you the most. Uh, oh, wow. Um, the, first of all, I, was, um, I worked under uh, Martin O'Neill, um, who was uh, just an enormous presence um, that he brought, uh, a real leader, um, absolutely led the club 
in every department. Um, it was a little bit different back in the early 2000s and how clubs are run, but just a massive presence. Um, uh, yeah, I don't want to go too much, but it's... Uh, and then Gord Gordon after that was really, really very good in terms of uh, no matter what age. I was at a, a younger age, but no matter what age, he thought he could improve you technically, which was something that really stuck with me. Um, that's something I agree with. Um, and then through career, probably... You look at Roberto sort of working with him uh, at the age of 27, 28 was, was, was really the sort of change of how I saw football and how it can be played. Um, so that was such a, a really big influence, um, having Roberto at that time. And then, and then Gordon came in as the national manager. So it was, um, for those two or three years, was a really, really great period. I'd, I'd say that was the sort of the defining period in terms of what I saw and what I believed in, in terms of coaching. So all those managers had qualities, but let me pick up on that one point you made there. You said Roberto changed your mindset on the way you played. What do you mean by that? Um, uh, the style of play um, and sort of his his sort of philosophy or, or uh, well, it's generally style of play or game model. There's numerous ways to call it now, but it's um, yeah, his his so playing in a team in with his style uh, and how he saw the game played in a more positional orientated just made complete sense um, and I've spoke previously even even some uh, ex-teammates at Scotland um, in terms of at times I don't think anyone can ever um, question um, uh, Scottish players or Scottish teams uh, work rate or the desire that they put into matches um, just sometimes when we played really top European teams or teams on the continent where they, they play a different a different style and uh, at times the the effort and the effort level um, it, it isn't the sort of deciding factor when you play against teams that are tactically um, better than you or more advanced. It, it's the it's the it's the area of the game that means that they're, they're most likely to win the match. Yeah, um, let me talk about uh, an old teammate of yours, uh, Neil Lennon. Is what wonders at Celtic? Are you surprised? No, not surprised. Um, it was such a such a such a difficult sort of period for the club when Brendan left and Neil came in. Um, so did really well to sort of. It did feel from the outside that it sort of it was quite steady sort of transition when I think all around it was really it was really difficult time with, with Brendan leaving and Neil coming in. And last season, from New Year New Year on, they were just exceptional. Um, the sort of level of uh, consistency and the level of play they had was. Um, was really really good. So uh, no, not surprised, but uh, yeah, impressed. Really impressed with the Celtic team for the the last sort of three months of the season. There, they were exceptional. Yeah, two different styles from Brendan going on to Neil. Uh, Neil's he, he's passionate, but I, I am a big fan because I think he is a very good coach and underrated. What's your take on him? Um, no, so similar really. Like just just really good manager. Um. Did very well in his first spell. Um, did really well with Hibs. Obviously went down south in a, again, I don't know too much, but it looks a really difficult period at Bolton um, for the club. And it's just, um, yeah, done done exceptionally well last year in a, in a challenging year as well because at New Year, again, everyone, the challenge was there and um, and how the team would react and under that amount of pressure. Um, and they were, uh, the manager and the team were, were, were exceptional. Um, so yeah, no, Neil, no surprise, and um, no, definitely not underrated. I think he's done a fantastic job. Yeah, um, can you see anyone stopping them getting ten in a row? Well, yeah, for sure, Rangers are going to come back with a um, challenge again. Um, uh, I think, I think we all thought New Year, watching the New Year derby um, and the cup final. Look, I think Rangers were were very good in the League Cup and obviously the last derby, um, and we all expected a really strong challenge. So. I think um, I think we have to expect the same again, um, and it's just um, it's just how how long that that challenge can be sustained. I'm sure Rangers will will obviously be hoping to sustain it for as long as possible, and um, and Celtic will look. I think Celtic, although they've been so dominant for so long, I think they'll still look to try and improve the squad. Um, I think the the signing of the goalkeeper Fraser again was just huge. I, Obviously, Odson has been was fantastic all year, but the, the games that I went to see Celtic Fraser was um, 
just enormous presence again um, in really big games, Lazio, Rangers Cup final. So it, I think if they can manage to get him back, it would be uh, it'd be a huge signing for them again this season. Yeah, as long as he's not too pricey, which it seems to be the big problem. Yeah, that uh, when you read uh, or what you read uh, and you hear, yeah, that's a that's an issue. But it was the same issue as when they got him last season. So um, I'm sure Celtic will be trying everything they can. And I, I understand that what's happened the last three months must have an impact on every club. Um, so uh, yeah, you can understand if it doesn't work because finances. But yeah, really hopeful that they can they can bring him back. I think he was such a big difference in in that team last year. Really, really big difference. Yeah, you touched on Odds and Edouard there. Today of all days, you know, Scotland, the Netherlands, Belgium all have a, a real worry that if FIFA extend the transfer window to somewhere like October, it'll allow clubs to continually go and cherry pick the best players. And and right now, Odds and Edouard is front and centre of so many clubs looking at him. Yeah, you can you can understand um, why there's so many many clubs looking at him in, in terms of his performances um, domestically and, and in Europe. Um, and I think he's been very good. Uh, I haven't seen the games, but uh, the number of goals for the, the French under-21 team. The transfer window, look, it's also open for Celtic. So, uh, look, Celtic will be signing players. Rangers will be signing players. Uh, same as teams in Holland and, and Belgium. Um, so, yeah, if it's open to October, then is it... it it's open for everyone. Um, I think it is. It's it's a difficult moment because Odson, I'm sure, will want to play it. Um, if there is a top four team in England or a really big team in in a in another league, you can understand a really big bid coming. But for the club, and uh, it's very hopeful that he can stay for at least one more year. I think. Uh, I think I read Neil saying something similar um, that they were maybe offering him a new contract. So, um, yeah, hopefully one more year. In mind, you were you were a a man who knew his way to goal on many an occasion for Celtic. You've had a look at him. How highly do you rate him? Yeah, very highly. Um, uh, I worked with him a little bit when I when I was there um, because um, Musa was still there. Um, so uh, Odson was, wasn't the first choice. So there was a couple of times he he came back to play for in the Premier League tournament that we had. Um, just he's, he's just has every attribute really as a, as a number nine now. Um, technically really good, very good physically, um, just has a, has a great manner as well, never seems too phased. Um, so yeah, I think as you've seen Musa go to Lyon and, and, and sort of go to another level, I, I think you have to expect, um, or you expect that Odson will do exactly the same um, when the time comes for, for him to, to move to uh, whichever sort of step he sees. Just before you go, uh, Sean, got to ask you, I mean, Scottish football in lockdown at the moment, we have a strange situation where we have a, a, a businessman who's got quite a bit of money, he's got a fantastic CV, and he's given Scottish football a £3 million gift with no strings attached. It's, it's the most remarkable situation we find ourselves in here. People are tearing down statues. Maybe the SPFL should put one up for James Anderson. Yeah, it's an incredible situation. Um... It's uh, yeah, no. What you're saying there, it's um, I think I think it's just incredible, really, that this has happened. Um, and I think in the course of time, we'll we'll, we'll see exactly the the impact that it has. But it's um, yeah, fantastic gesture. Um, and uh, hopefully, it's spent wisely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, lockdown. When we all get out of it and get back playing, um, would you like to see expanded leagues? Do you think that would help our game, or do you think it's just a case of survival more than anything else? I don't. I don't think it. Look, it's, I can understand both arguments. Um, clubs, if there's a financial impact, a negative impact on them, then I can understand why clubs won't want to change the the dynamic of the league. I'm 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 not I'm not in the league at the moment in terms of really working in it, so I, I can't really speak too much on it. But it's I would prefer I would prefer a reconstruction. Um, I think it looks um, I think it will help the product. I think in the long term, um, I think that has to be where where we have to look to go with the league. I think it's a really good league. I think it can be showcased far better than it has done. Um, I think we as a country have to maybe be a bit more positive about it. Like we, 
got some really good players and some really both old firm teams have had really really big results in Europe this um, this year so um, and look we had a really big title challenge um, come new year so the product's good um, and for me a reconstruction I think would only help that well listen, but I don't know I don't know enough about it huh? I, I don't yeah, know don't every worry. detail that, that but that has, has come about yeah. Don't worry, you won't get an unexpected call to be the head of the SFA. Calm down, you're all right. No, I can't, I can't see that happening. <laughs> the, the, the one thing I would say to you is you're 37, you're sucking up as much knowledge as possible. I, I do wish you every success. If I can say, it's 22 years ago today that we actually took to the field in France for Scotland against Brazil. If I can just make one plea on behalf of this whole nation, suck up as much knowledge as possible and come back in help us out when you eventually do come back to Scotland. Oh, of course, yeah, yeah. Of course I will and absolutely. Look, it's my home. It's, uh, it's a country I love, so yeah, fingers crossed, yeah. Sean, I wish you every success for the future. Thank you very much for joining us. No, thanks for having me. Appreciate it. Thanks. Join us each weekday at 4pm for Scottish football's biggest daily show, the PLZ Football Show Live. We have the biggest guests, regular exclusives and the best panel in the game. And because it's live, you can send your comments directly to the panel during the show. <laughs> Just like and subscribe to make sure you never miss out. Join the winning team. Expect the best used car deals guaranteed. Visit Arnold Clark.